Well, good morning, everybody. Sure, it's good to see all these faces. Uh, I've, I've missed you. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Ellen Honeycutt this morning as our first speaker for uh, 2022. Ellen is the current chair of the Georgia Native Plant Society. Uh, a good many of us, in fact, watching the for the last half, half hour, it looks like you know most of us are already know her or met her at some point, either uh, uh, as members of the GNPS, which a few of us are, or uh, at, at one of the many events that, that she attends. Um, a few of us joined her a few months ago uh, at Lost Corner, where uh, where she walked the trail. Uh, and walking a trail with Ellen is uh, is an eye opening experience. It's like having a veil lifted, even even after walking on a trail that you've been on many times, and it's just seeing it uh, in a completely different way. Um, uh, one of the things I have I've discovered in uh, finding out more about Ellen is is her blog, and and I really encourage you to. Uh, to, to take a look at it. It's called Using Georgia Native Plants. And we'll get that uh, link out to everyone. Um, it started back in 2010. And I started reading it in 2010. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, it's my winter reading. So it's wonderful to have you here to, today, Ellen. And uh, uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. OK, thank you very much. Um... I did prepare a, a handout for this, so I uh, hope you got that. Um, so that way you don't have to write down everything I said, especially when it comes to the resources. But so I'm here today to talk about native plants. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not sure why that little GIF's not working. Uh, there we go. Uh, so I'm here today to talk about native plants and I understand that this is maybe one of several presentations that you're going to have this year on native plant topics, or uh, I understand they're also planning one about invasive plants. But today's topic is going to be a bit of an intro. So I know that uh, a lot of you already know about native plants. I hope this won't repeat too much, but maybe serve as a basic framework to go from. So. Uh, I started working with native plants um, about the beginning of the year 2000 when I went on a plant rescue after someone told me that I could get free plants that way. And, uh, and I started learning about them and I decided I liked them more than non-native plants. And so that's what I've been doing ever since then. Uh, and I live not far from you guys. Uh, so speaking to the North Fulton Master Gardeners, it feels like home to me because I live just outside of North Fulton in Southeast Cherokee County. So we want to talk about uh, what are native plants and, and the definition really hasn't changed. So, uh, those of you that um, already know this, native plants are those that were here before European settlers arrived. And of course, people talk about, well, what about um, beans and corn and squash? But we know that indigenous people over the last thousand or two years before European settlers came, moved things around. They brought plants up from Central America. They moved them around North America. So uh, we, don't include beans, corn, and squash when we consider native plants, but everything else is good. And when we talk about native, uh, we want to be very regionally appropriate. So as I'm sure all of you know, we have five to six eco-regions here in Georgia. Uh, we're in the Piedmont, which is that big dark green part. Uh, and above us, uh, we have to the left, the Appalachian Plateau and the Ridge and Valley. And then of course, uh, the Blue Ridge in the Northeastern section. And then below us is the Coastal Plain, uh, which is sometimes, but not always divided into the upper and lower Coastal Plain. So when I'm talking about uh, native plants to use, I'm primarily talking about Piedmont plants. Although you'll see 
that a lot of coastal plain plants get brought up into the Piedmont, particularly evergreen ones. And I'm sure you probably know this, but if you didn't, there is the fall line in Georgia. It divides uh, the Piedmont and the coastal plain areas. And in fact, is a very specific geologic boundary uh, because that's where an ocean used to be. And that's why the coastal plain is so very sandy and well draining because it all used to be underwater. Uh, but uh, the fall line is very interesting. If you haven't uh, been to places on the fall line, there's a state park called High Falls State Park uh, that has a beautiful waterfall. And it, it basically is water that's transitioning from the rocky area of the Piedmont down into the sandy soils of the coastal plain. So why should master gardeners know about native plants? One of the things is that master gardeners talk to the public a lot about plants. And of course, sometimes you're asked to recommend plants, usually for specific reasons, such as difficult spots, wet or shady, or even worse, wet and shady, sloped, or even for privacy. So knowing about native plants that work in those situations will add to your repertoire of what you might be able to recommend to people. And just imagine how many more native plants we could get into gardens if all master gardeners actively suggested them to people who ask for plant ideas. So we see you guys as a, as a powerful vehicle for letting people know what their options are. Helping master gardeners learn about native plants, why they're valuable, how they can be used would of course have a big impact. So my goal today is to whet your appetite for more and to give you resources for learning further. And again, on the handout, um, that is where you can uh, see a lot of the resources. So why should we use native plants? They need less water and fertilizer was the reason that was given prior to 2007. And it's still a really good reason. Of course, these plants are adapted to this area. Um, they know that sometimes it's cold, hot, cold, snow, too much water, not enough water, and they're used to that. But ever since 2007, We've actually learned a very powerful reason to use native plants. And that's what we focus on when we're trying to educate people today. Uh, Bringing Nature Home is a book that came out in 2007. So I think probably a lot of you are aware of it or even have read it yourself. And what this book is, is it was put together by Doug Tallamy, who happens to be a professor of entomology. So insects at the University of Delaware. And what he did was he brought together a lot of research that had already been done, but hadn't really uh, made it into public knowledge about the relationship between native insects, especially Lepidoptera, which is butterflies and moths and native plants. And he brought it together in a very engaging and even down to earth uh, way of understanding. So it's very readable. And if you haven't read it, I certainly encourage you to do so. And what he found uh, was that, uh, uh, as you can see here, all plants are not created equal and that most of our native plant eaters are not able to eat alien plants, that is non-native plants. And that as we replace native plants in the landscape with alien species, we're actually seeing a decline in the number of insects. So this is the reason that we try to encourage people to use native plants now, because native plants evolved with insects and with birds in our area 
over thousands of years. The insect herbivores, which is a term for insects that eat plants, either they eat the leaves or they eat the pollen or, or they sample the nectar. And insect herbivores might be able to eat several native plants, but sometimes, and this is the important part, sometimes they can eat just one. And so because they can only eat just one, we'll call these specialists, then it's important to make sure that we have the plants that they need or we won't have as many of them anymore. Uh, monarch butterfly is probably our best example and it's the one I like to use and a lot of other people too because people are so familiar with it. The monarch butterfly of course comes through Georgia and it actually comes through Georgia twice a year. In the spring, around April, early April, uh, it moves north and it goes south in the fall, usually in August and September. But in both directions, it lays eggs for the next generation. And it lays eggs only on plants in the milkweed family and the caterpillars can grow up on them exclusively. So the monarch can't lay eggs on crepe myrtle, can't lay eggs on grass, it's not gonna lay eggs on our tomatoes. It's going to look for milkweed. How it finds it, I'm not really sure because it does, but, uh, and that's the only place it's gonna lay the egg. Our state butterfly is the Eastern tiger swallowtail. Now it's not limited to a single plant like the monarch is. It has several of them, including a tulip tree, which we sometimes call tulip poplar, black cherry, ash, and sweet bay magnolia. So this is very beneficial to this butterfly because if something happens to one of those plants, it can still keep going with the other plants. And so it's not likely that we'll lose the Eastern tiger swallowtail because it has so many hosts. And here's its little caterpillar. I took this picture uh, on an ash leaf and you can see it's actually constructed itself a little canopy uh, to protect itself. And if you look at the four trees that I just mentioned, this is how many caterpillars they can support. So the tulip tree, can actually support 21 different kinds of caterpillars. The ash tree can support 149 different. Black cherry, some sort of super plant there, that's no typo, 456 different types of caterpillars can use that tree as a host plant. And then sweet bay magnolia, 21. So that all adds up to 647. If you just had those four trees in your yard, you could be supporting 647 different kinds of caterpillars, including the tiger swallowtail. But the support doesn't stop there. What I like to tell people is that native plants also do double and even triple duty. Uh, they support bees. Here's the tulip tree flower. It's very, very supportive of bees. If you, if you know, if you keep bees or if you know people who keep bees, they say this is a very important spring plant for pollen and nectar. And then of course the birds will eat the seeds. This is red cardinal eating uh, the seeds of the tulip poplar. So when you have a native plant, you can actually support lots of different things, not just have it be attractive in your yard, but you could be supporting caterpillars, bees and birds as well. And this is kind of important, I think, as we develop more uh, smaller and smaller <laughs> yards to make sure that our gardens are providing the most impact possible to the ecosystem if that's your, your sort of thing, of course. But then we have the zebra swallowtail. This brings us back to, it is a butterfly that only uses one type of native plant, the pawpaw. And if 
we lost the pawpaw in our area due to development and it was no longer in the wild spaces and we hadn't added it back to our gardens, we wouldn't have this butterfly at all because it wouldn't able, be able to lay its eggs and create the next generation. Now moths outnumber butterflies. I don't know if you know, but in North America, we have 800 species of butterflies which is a lot, 800 is a lot. But when it comes to moths, we have 11,000 species of moths in North America. But they have the same needs as butterflies. They're gonna look for a special host plant or two to raise their young. This guy is the oak worm moth. Uh, I took a picture of him. He must have just emerged from his cocoon because he was, uh, he was kind of slow and he was perfectly willing to be perched on a stick for this photo, but they're the ones with the black and white striped caterpillars, usually in August and September on our oak trees. So let's look at some of the numbers. So a lot of people say, well, I'm sure the non-native plants support the insects too. This top 12 list, which is on your handout, uh, was pulled together by Doug Tallamy. And you can see that oak is the number one supportive plant. And luckily we do have lots of oaks in the North Fulton area, but it, an oak tree can support 557 different species of moths and butterflies when it comes to laying their eggs on them. There's that black cherry again, number two, 456. And you just run down that list of top 12 plants. That's a lot of things that we could be using in our garden that would having a, have a big impact on the insect population. Then you look at the bottom, crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle only supports three different kinds of moths, moths and butterflies. Nandina, zero. When we have a Nandina in our garden, as far as insects are concerned, it might as well just be plastic. Butterfly bush, only one butterfly or moth can use it to raise the next generation. Yeah, it's good nectar plant, but that's all it is. It's not helping them any other way. Ligustrum, 24, and that's because we actually have a native ligustrum and other native members of the olive family um, so that's probably why it has a few more. Autumn olive, thorny olive, nine, Mahonia, zero. So when we have these in our yard, I have a neighbor that has a yard full of Mahonia and he's just, he's just not helping the butterflies and moths at all when it comes to that. Native bees also reply, rely on native plants. There's 106 species of native bees in Georgia that are specialists. So that means they need specific plants even for their nectar and pollen gathering. Most of them are specialists on plants in the aster family. Aster family is huge in North America. It's one of our uh, signature plants and it includes asters, black-eyed Susans, goldenrod, sunflowers, thistles, coneflowers, uh, bone sets. So very popular perennial uh, kind of family and great to have for native bees. Here's an example of a specialist bee. This is the southeastern blueberry bee. It evolved over time to get pollen and nectar exclusively from blueberries. And I hope you know that blueberries are native plants always, even the ones in the grocery store came from native plants. Even when they came from Peru and Chile, they came from our plants that were shipped over there and grown. Just like today, we grow peaches uh, that aren't from here. Same thing, they sent our blueberries down to South America to provide us with winter fruit. But after the blueberries are all done flowering, so they flower in late February on into early May. Once they're done flowering, this bee is done too. She's made the next generation. 
they're all safely in their nest waiting to emerge in the spring. So you won't see this uh, bee after that until it's time again. And But we wouldn't get nearly as many blueberries without her because native bees are highly efficient on native plants. Native bees like this mason bee can pollinate more effectively than honeybees. 250 of these mason bees can pollinate an entire acre of fruit trees. Yet today you see us shipping bees around the country on tractor trailers just to do that. But we could be using the native bees, cultivating them in a way to pollinate. And mason bees are native bees that nest in hollow plant stems in the spring. So when you hear people talk about not cleaning up your garden until later in the spring, it's because the bees are living in those hollow, hollow stems waiting to come out when, once it warms up. And birds rely on native plants too, but in different ways. To understand how birds use native plants, we do have to kind of understand how what birds eat. Uh, frugivores eat fruit. Those include robins, cedar wax wings, mockingbirds. Granivores eat seeds. So those are cardinals and goldfinches, house finches, morning doves. Insectivores eat insects, caterpillars, spiders, mosquitoes, wasps, and beetles. And this is a huge family. This is the biggest family of all. And they include warblers and bluebirds, wrens and phoebes, including the state brown, uh, the state bird, the brown thrasher is an insectivore. And then omnivores eat a little bit of everything. Those are our turkeys, our crows, our bluebirds, woodpeckers. And then nectivores, which primarily is the hummingbird, of course, eats plant nectar. But regardless of what they eat as adults, 96% of birds feed insects to their babies in the nest. And one of the studies recently from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology used a camera to monitor a nest of breeding chickadees. And they monitored how many times the parents brought food back to the nest. And they found that over a two week period from the time the birds hatched until they fledged, that the mother, the parents fed them between 7,500 and 9,500 insects. That's a lot of bugs. If you want to have just one nest of baby birds in your yard, Look how many bugs they need to find to raise those. And that doesn't even include once they fledged, the parents continue to feed them. This was only while they were in the nest. So 96% of baby birds. And one fun fact, if you wanna know a very common bird that does not feed its babies insects, it's the American goldfinch. They feed their babies seeds. And as a result, they nest later in the year than any other bird because they have to wait for the spring plants to start to set seeds before they can raise their babies. Fruits matter too. Uh, the fruits of native plants like this spice bush are high in fat or high in sugar and they ripen just when migrating birds need them the most. Birds do eat non-native fruits like privet, but it's a fruit of last resort for them. And they've done studies and found that the nutritional content of privet is not as good as native fruits, and therefore the birds actually have to eat more to get the same amount of nutrition, kind of like if we ate um, Twinkies instead of sandwiches. Um, yeah, we'd probably have to eat a few more to get the same nutrition. Uh, native viburnums are a favorite of some of our frugivore birds. So there's, there's plenty of native plants that have fruit available for birds once you start to do the research. 
And of course they're beautiful too. I mean, I don't want to, you to think that native plants are only here to be utilitarian. They are just as beautiful as non-native plant. This is the viburnum when it's in bloom. And as you probably know, since you're master gardeners, this is many tiny little flowers and each one of those could actually turn into a fruit itself. Seeds and nectar are some of the other support that our native plants provide. This is American goldfinch on native sunflower. All sunflowers are native as well. And of course they produce a lot of seeds. This is the annual sunflower. And then hummingbirds looking for nectar. And I'm always surprised to see them get nectar from such tiny flowers as this cone flower. Because of course the cone flower isn't a single flower. It actually is many tiny flowers nestled in between those uh, hard spines. So there's quite a lot of nectar in there. And it's good for bees, butterflies, as well as hummingbirds. Another point that I like to make when I'm talking to people about using native plants is sense of place. Georgia has unique flowers. It's not the same flowers as Colorado or Maine or Wisconsin or Florida or Texas. I'm sure we have some overlaps, but when it comes to the beauty of Georgia, it's represented by our native plants, like the bloodroot in the letter G or the columbine in the letter E. And then there's our blueberries. And in the letter R, we have phlox. Phlox is a uniquely North American plant. All of the species of phlox that you know are all North American natives. Then in the next letter G, we have asters and stone mountain daisy. Then in the fall, the letter I, we get fall color. And of course, the last, we have the fruits of some of our native hollies. So Georgia wouldn't be Georgia if we didn't really showcase some of our native plants in our gardens. Here again, this is a bigger picture of that Georgia aster and Stone Mountain Daisy. This is a picture from actually one of our members gardens um, several years ago. And these plants were good for the bees while they were blooming, they'll turn into seeds afterwards and they'll feed the birds all winter long. Again, doing multiple duties as well as being beautiful for us. Um, coral honeysuckle, this is one of, one of our better known native plants because it is so beautiful, but look at it on this old fashioned Southern porch. It's, uh, it's beautiful and it helps make our homes really represent Georgia. Christmas fern, uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you know this plant. It's very common in this area, but it's beautiful. And this is a picture from the spring when the fronds are unfurling and, uh, and it's evergreen. So it's great right now when there's not much else in the landscape to see that out. Native azaleas, yes, the Japanese azaleas are nice, but to me, they really don't compare with the native azaleas. This is Piedmont native, the Piedmont azalea, which is perfectly native in our area, and it's wonderfully fragrant, which the Japanese azaleas don't even have. And of course, our butterflies love it. Father Gilla, another wonderful native plant, great for the landscape, uh, full sun. Uh, I've had monarchs on it in April. It has gorgeous fall color. It's just a wonderful plant. So we don't have to give up good looks. We want to recommend and use our native plants really like you would any plant. This is Virginia Sweet Spire. This is actually in Fulton, north, very north Fulton County up uh, at the Birmingham Crossroads. Uh, I saw this blooming one year and stopped and took a picture, but 
I had a gorgeous mass of Virginia sweet spire next to this porch. So it's beautiful in the spring. And then this one also has great fall color. So I hope this is helping to inspire you to learn more about native plants. Uh, Want to talk about how master gardeners can help the public learn more. And then also talk about some of the resources that are available to you on your path to learning more. Here's some resources. Uh, Homegrown National Park is Doug Tallamy's new site where they encourage people to put some native plants in their yard and start to create a new network of residential landscapes that if you added them all together would be the biggest national park we had. Georgia Native Plant Society is a resource. Georgia Audubon, several years ago, Audubon realized how important native plants were to native birds. And they've gotten into supporting native plants in a really big way. And we couldn't be happier to partner with them in almost anything we do. Uh, on the right, University of Georgia has great resources. The College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences has a number of publications. They have uh, four native plant publications. Um, They're really large and detailed. I also recommend, uh, as I said, blueberries are native plants. They have a great publication for growing blueberries. Uh, it gives a lot of very useful information. And then as Ben said, I have a blog down there on the lower left. Um, I put out something weekly about using native plants in the landscape. So what can you do? I want you to learn more about native plants and perhaps keep a list of recommendations handy. You might develop one specifically for North Fulton so that when people call and ask or they stop by a table and ask, you can pull that out and say, well, here, here's ideas for you. Down here, I just showed a snippet of one that the Native Plant Society put together. These are our suggested alternatives or alternatives, if that helps you remember. Uh, so somebody might say, well, you know, I need some evergreen shrubs. And as you can see, they usually look to ligustrum or one of the olives or autoleucan laurel. But you could suggest things like wax myrtle, hollies, anise, lakothui, and others. Um, and some of these, as I said earlier, are coastal plain natives, wax myrtle and um, Florida anise, American olive, Carolina cherry laurel are actually all from the coastal plain. But people have found that they grow very well up here. And of course, they still provide some support to insects. And with the exception of the Carolina cherry laurel, um, they're usually not very aggressive and they don't seed out as much as the, native, as the privet does. And the olive, oh my goodness, you're probably seeing as much as I am how much that olive seeds out. You can incorporate native plants into your master gardener projects and talks like your demonstration gardens. Uh, as Ben said, uh, you have uh, the Lost Corner Preserve on site projects. You could be uh, creating signage and using plant, creating signage for the plants you already have. Uh, you might add more native plants to that landscape. Any community, community classes that you develop, if you would just incorporate native plants as part of the discussion, uh, you don't have to make a big deal out of it. It's just matter of fact, when you're choosing plants, sometimes native is a good choice. In fact, of course, I would say it's always a good choice, but, uh, and then your speakers bureau, maybe you would develop talks that uh, introduce the concept of native plants to other people, and then use that um, when you give presentations. I like to consider that native plants are plants with benefits, and that they can really be beautiful in any design garden. 
and just use them like you would use any other plant. And what else can you do? Of course, you can support insects by reducing pesticide use. Talk to people about some of the good old fashioned alternatives we had before pesticides became so common. You know, spray them off with the hose, squish them with your fingers, uh, get a soapy bucket. I still, when it comes to Japanese beetles, I go out there with a soapy bucket and uh, just drop them into the bucket. Um, it's a, still a very good way to do it and, and strangely satisfying. Also, if you would help the public learn more about how plants support insects and why that is a good thing, why some leaf damage is acceptable, because that means it's working. And incorporate concepts like, well, insects feed birds. If you like to have birds, if you like to have baby birds, you're gonna wanna have a few bugs. Of course, we would love for those of you who are not already a member to join the Native Plant Society for activities, including plant rescues. It is still very true that if you're a member of the Plant Society, you can go on plant rescues and take home plants for your own garden or for your community garden. We've recently implemented chapters in the North Metro area. So if you live north of the perimeter, I would suggest you join the North Metro Atlanta chapter. That's the one that I'm in. And if you are inside the perimeter, maybe you would join the in-town Atlanta chapter. Or, but events for both are open to everyone, any members, even the public. Um, so you're not limited once you join a chapter, you can still go to anybody's event. And you might think I took this picture this weekend, but no, it was from uh, several years ago. So I certainly encourage you guys to go native in your own landscapes and to recommend it to others. Thanks. And I am happy to take questions. Hey, Alan, this is Sandy again. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, and. Um, just such a great overview. Um, I have a question regarding the oak tree. Um, are all oak trees supportive of, of uh, caterpillars and insects? Um, I heard someone say it's just white oak. Does, does the pin oak also support a lot of insects? Yeah, it would be all oaks, although I would be a little cautious. There is one... Um non-native oak that gets sold, especially through the Forestry Commission called Sawtooth Oak. So since that one is from Asia, we don't know if that one supports it as well, but all of the native oaks should be equally uh, supportive. So it could be a white or a red or a pin oak or a willow oak. Yes. Great, thank you. Something I wanted to add. This is Doug Hartong, and I was talking to Jane about this. We walked over at Smith's plantation. Mandine is another one of undesirability traits. Is that a question? I, I couldn't who's, hear that. Yeah, or is who's, answering it? Is asking that? It was Doug. Can he can he do it again? Maybe. Speak louder, Doug. No, no, we can't hear you. Okay, how about you put it in the chat? Type it in the chat and, and let's let someone else go. But if you type it in the chat, um, then Ellen can answer it also. In the meanwhile, Ellen, I do have a question it can, further to the question about oak. Um, I have a lot of very active oak trees where, as it comes to the oak, the oak uh, wood worms. How much defoliation can an oak tree take? Because I, I, I stand in amazement sometimes that it's almost got no leaves left and it still comes back the following year. Right. And when it comes to most caterpillars are active in the summer and into the fall. So the best time I have uh, for looking for caterpillars, which I like to do, is I find them usually then. And by then, 
you know, the tree is almost done with its leaves, right? If we're talking August and September is when we see these heavy infestation of oakworm moths, um, they're done with them. You know, all we're missing out is maybe some fall color. So uh, with the exception of maybe fall web worms, which really freak people out because they make those big webs that's that's not the same thing, but even those trees, I have had uh, some of my sourwood trees covered in those nests, and uh, and the tree comes back fine the next year. They're almost done with their leaves by the time caterpillars come along. Good point. Thank you. All right, and I see Doug got his point in the chat, so let's just uh, talk about that here. Um, so uh, Doug was pointing out that Nandina berries are toxic to birds, especially cedar waxwings. And that is true. And that's a good reason to remove the, the fruit. And it's, it's while we do like to talk about they're toxic to birds, it's really mostly a problem for the cedar waxwings because they have a natural, and I wanna stress that's the word, a natural tendency to gorge. So that's just their behavior. We can't teach them to do it differently. I've seen a lot of people say, well, it's their own fault. They shouldn't eat that many, but that's just how they are. And so uh, Nandina berries do have a tiny amount of cyanide in them. And when, and when those birds eat a lot of them, it just, it's too much. Um, so yes, you should, if you still have Nandina, if I still haven't convinced you to get that plastic bush out of your landscape, please cut the fruits off today and put them in your trash uh, so that the wax wings don't eat them. Ellen, uh, it's Ben. Uh, one of the things that, that I picked up when we walked Lost Law, Law Corner together is uh, the impact of invasives. And it was much more extensive than, than I anticipated. And, and, and also, uh, I was surprised when, when you talked about some of the, uh, at least one of the magnolias that was invasive and, and others. Would you talk a little bit about invasives? Right. Uh, and invasive plants uh, uh, can be spread in different ways. A lot of people talk about, well, it's not invasive in my yard. I don't I don't understand what you're talking about, but a lot of the true invasive ones, except for kudzu and wisteria, which are aggressive vines, come about because of birds, right? So, so privet, mahonia, nandina, the thorny olives, those are spread by birds eating the fruits and then flying some distance away, sometimes only, you know, 50 feet away, but over time, that plant's going to grow up, it'll have fruit, then it gets spread another 50 feet and keep going. So, um, and magnolia is one of them. Magnolias have those nice fleshy fruits, but the southern magnolia is what Ben's talking about, which, which is our traditional iconic southern magnolia, large tree, evergreen leaves, hard to rake, you know that one. And it is a coastal plain native. And up here in the Piedmont, what they found is that it has a tendency to become aggressive, that uh, it germinates very well, it's not too cold for it, and you start to see it take over some woodlands. And there's several examples in the metro Atlanta area uh, where you can look in the woods and see all of these wild evergreen azaleas and all of those came because of bird droppings. Do you advocate removing those? Well, I advocate for diversity. And so when something starts to outcompete other things like that, then I think sometimes we need to help remove some of it, right? So, so if you're getting too much of that magnolia, I would encourage you to remove some of it and let other plants have a chance because there's a lot of different insects out there and they have different needs. Well, one of the things that struck me was when you were talking about uh, how those magnolias shouted out other plants. Right. Shouting, you know, 
Yeah. Right, because they, they do get big and they're evergreen, so they're going to create shade and they'll outcompete. You know, seedlings that are trying to come up underneath them won't get the light that they need to grow. So, yeah, it would shade them out, outcompete. Ellen, there's another question that has come in uh, via chat um, from Nancy Bermel asking uh, for um, if you would share resources for native plants. Obviously, the big box stores don't carry many of them. If right. Any. And on the handout, uh, one of the resources I put is a link on the Georgia Native Plant Society website for sources we try to keep a list of nurseries that we know carry native plants. I mean, somebody mentioned Buck Jones earlier. Buck Jones in Woodstock uh, on the road between Roswell and Canton is a perfectly good shrub and tree nursery if you know what you're looking for. They do have a lot of non-native plants, but I have gotten some great native shrubs and trees from there too. So. You you do have to know what you're looking for. In the case of Buck Jones, um, all their plants are listed by a common name. So you kind of have to do a little research on that. Although when you get to the nursery, they will show you the scientific name. So I encourage you, you know, we all, you know, we all have smartphones now, right? And, and we can uh, look them up on the spot while we're in the nursery to see if it's native. Thank you. Um, another question, um, if you want, if we want to remove invasive shrubs, what is the best way to dispose of those, dispose of those shrubs? Well, I'll talk about removing and disposing. If it's a fruiting uh, non-native shrub, so if you have privet or that thorny olive or nandina or mahonia and they have fruit, I would encourage you to immediately cut the fruit and put it in your trash so that you can tie up the bag and, and really dispose of it. Once you've done that, I mean, you can compost the limbs just like you would for any plant. You could strip the leaves off of it, use it for a wattle or whatever you want to do. But uh, as far as removing it, you know, a lot of people are against pesticides and uh, herbicides. Let me use specifically use the word herbicide. But when it comes to a large shrub, especially if you're in a stream bank area where you have the potential for erosion control, some of those shrubs get really big. I would say you could cut them to the ground, or usually I leave about a three to four inch stump in case I have to recut it later. And then just carefully paint with a foam brush a little herbicide on there and let it die and decompose in place so that you don't have erosion control. You could plant next to it, you know, put your new uh, native shrub right next to it while it slowly dies and decomposes. But yeah, once you remove the fruits, you could, you could dispose of the shrub like you would any woody cutting. Another question uh, similar to the earlier one, um, does the Native Plant Society promote native species with large commercial nurseries such as Pikes and Home Depot? That is on our list of things to do. Uh, we just um, finished uh, developing a three-year strategic plan uh, and we recognize that we weren't doing enough to help the larger nurseries promote and stock native plants. So we're gonna to try to do that. We'd like, for example, to encourage um, some of our more local nurseries, such as Buck Jones, to start labeling their plants with the word native, right? So that when people go into the nursery, they might quickly be able to see, oh, there's a sticker on it that says it's native and I can feel good about buying it. Um, so yeah, we want to help them showcase natives as well as learn to stock more natives. Thank you. Um, Donna has asked a question. Um, there are many varieties of coneflowers. Do the cultivars support the insects the same as the natives? That's a very good question. And, and the Native Plant Society recently published uh, our statement on cultivars. 
Um, the research that has been done, and there has been several people doing research over the last five years, and what they've found is that when it comes to cultivars, there's two main things that impact how useful it is to insects. One is uh, double versus single blooms. So if the cultivar was created for double flowers, usually that happens at the expense of nectar and pollen. So you want to try and stay away from those cultivars unless you just want to use them because they're pretty. But if you're, uh, if you're trying to use them to support insects, uh, don't buy as many of those and go back to the more species one. The second aspect is the color of the leaves. Now we talked about how we want the insects to eat some of our leaves. What they found is that uh, cultivars that deliberately create burgundy colored leaves offer less support. So for example, you have um, the Eastern redbud, which is a, a very beautiful native tree and it normally has green leaves. And then some cultivars have come out. Um, probably the most well-known one is forest pansy and it holds burgundy leaves all year long. Well, during the growing season, but they have found that because it, cultivates that darker color, it is somewhat less useful to insects that would eat it. So those two factors, I would encourage you to stay away from. Regarding coneflower specifically, all I know is that a lot of people say that the, the red ones, the orange ones don't last very long, that they're not very long lived. So there's that. Save your money. <laughs> Very good. Um, are any plans to address the HOA rules that make it difficult to garden with natives? Um, at this time, we don't. What, what we want to focus on uh, in the next few years is helping cities write ordinances to help encourage native landscaping. Um, and, and, and perhaps that would trickle down to the impact on the uh, HOAs. Uh, we have a, a symposium, a, a conference coming up in February where one of our topics is going to be cues of care. And that's gonna help give people ideas on how they can use native plants and still have their neighbors like them. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Any other questions? Uh, Sandy, the uh, question came in about the handout. Did you send? Yep, I'm typing a response, um, but yeah, I could say I, I sent the handout to everyone. It is in the email I sent yesterday with the agenda. Okay, and, and we'll try to put a link to it um, in the YouTube description when we get this up on YouTube with Ellen's permission. May we share the handout too, Ellen? Yes, of course. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Get the word out. Yes. Okay, anyone yes, else? Yes, I, I, have, I have one, one thing. Okay. Um, I, I mentioned walking with Ellen and, and having, it's like mm -hmm. having a veil lifted from your eyes. Uh, reading her blog, actually back from, from 2010, <laughs> Uh, November the 28th, 2010, she did a blog on winter twigs. And uh, it shows twigs with also uh, berries and everything. So when you're walking, uh, after reading the blog, you're, you're aware of what to look for. I mean, you, you start looking for, for, uh, for plants that, that have berries on them. And also your ability to identify the, the twigs, uh, uh, just e even even though there, there are no leaves on it. So anyway, an another reason to read her blog. All right, and the blog has a search feature. Now, it, in order to use the search feature, you have to be looking at the web version. So either you're on a laptop 
or uh, a tablet or if you're on your phone and you go to the blog if you scroll down it'll mm -hmm. say use web version and then that will bring you the search bar um, and if, if you, you know if you if you go, do nothing more than, than look at the pictures <laughs> the pictures are fantastic <laughs> Um, Ellen, I have a question. Um, we are often uh, asked by people how to make their yard look nice. What's a beautiful flower? What is a plant that would be good in this area? But I think a lot of people are oriented toward beauty and the look of their yard and making it kind of a neat landscape. Are there any examples of this? Um, of a of a native landscape that we could kind of look at and see how native plants can be beautiful um and they don't have to be manicured like you know meatball shrubs or anything like that uh, because you know you can talk about natives but i think people think oh yeah along the side of the road it just looks like a big mess of of you know shrubs and brush and brambles but that's not what it has to look like. Do you, do you know what we could tell people to say, you know, how to make their, their yard native, but still beautiful? Right, and, and I think that, that the whole concept of cues of care, and, and actually one of my blogs, it, it, I think is that exact title, cues of care, is what you wanna do is you wanna group them and um, place them in order just like you would any other plant so you know instead of having just one purple cone flower you might have three or five you know you want to use the same kind of design and planting techniques that you would have used for any non-native plant and just you know have paths have a little yard art um, you know, and just you do it that way. It's just you're using native plants instead of begonias or something like that. So yeah, and then I think there was a question. Um, uh, oh, deer resistant. Uh, I have I have deer problems myself. Uh, I know I've done at least one blog on deer resistant uh, plants that I have found work for me. Um, so check that out and, and search on the blog. Um, upper left hand corner is a search box. Okay, well, we are right at um, 11 o'clock here. We could talk to you all day long and maybe we can have you again or create an event where we all walk someplace in nature and have you help us point things out. We'd love to spend more time with you. That sounds great. All thank righty. You. Well, thank you.